Hey, welcome to the fifth video in our series, Mastering EDM with Logic Pro. And today we're going to be covering uh, optimizing your workflow. And uh, so this isn't so much about learning a particular feature of Logic. It's more so learning how you could set it up so it'll work the way you want it to, when you want it to, and you don't have to um, go through set up each project. You could just kind of create a, uh, a, a default project. So um, off the bat here, one of the biggest things that I, I change is the um up here the transport and uh all the buttons up here and the information it's given me because honestly in logic pro 9 um it was i felt it was a lot better in what it showed me so right now actually uh what i want i don't want beats in project i want to go to custom here so i could change this all notice that got considerably longer um i like this better than what it had before but now it's missing some stuff that um that I, I still need and also it's also got extra stuff that I know I don't need so uh, I'm gonna tweak this up a little bit and just show you what I do and why I like to do this so um, right now it has the position of the um, the playhead and it's got locators which is essentially where your loops uh, where your loop is located and then you have um, tempo and the project end and you have the signature and division you have midi activity and you have load meters so um i'll close out of this really quick so i can try, kind of show you this is the load meters that's midi activity that's the um you know what um time your project is in this is the beats per minute this is the project end and it, it's got tool tips to basically show you everything um now i'll be honest i don't really need the uh, the locator locations because uh, I see those right here one is right here and one is right here and Moving it by way of this is kind of it doesn't really help me all that much when I could just drag it out there so um, so I'm gonna remove that and uh, I'm also going to remove the Signature slash division because I'm always working in four over four um, which is essentially four beats per bar uh, each each uh, beat being uh, uh, worth it's essentially the standard time. You know there are uh, three over four. There's three over three. There's 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 tons of ways you could split it up, but almost all um, pop, EDM, rock, and everything like that. It's four over four. So honestly, I don't feel I need to see that because it maybe once in my entire career that I'll change that. So I'm going to turn that off. And um, But I like to have MIDI activity. I like to have the load meters. And I like to have the tempo and the position of the uh, playhead. So, and I'll tell you why. The position of the playhead is nice because it shows you um, what the time is at that particular point and it shows you what bar and what beat you're at. That is very, very helpful. Um, without going into how it's helpful, you'll find that it's very, very helpful to have that information. And um, now with the BPM, you pretty much only change that once for a project, but um, every project you open that's gonna be different. So instead of going in, finding it and changing it, I prefer to have it up here. So whenever I create a new project, I can just drag that to wherever I need it. And uh, we'll have it at 128 because that's pretty much normal. Project end is good because you extend the project end often when you're working with uh, when you because you know it looks like you got a lot of room here till it gets to the end. But um, if I put the playhead at the end, now this is why it's useful. That's four minutes. So if you're doing a five or six minute song, you're going to be extending that. And uh, if you're doing trance, then those can get up to like uh, ten minutes or eight eight to ten minutes, and then you're definitely going to be wanting extend extending it. So. Um, uh, other than that, there are a couple other things. Um, if I look at uh, the the ways I can customize this again, um, so that's just the LCD, the transport. I've got a couple of things here: rewind, fast forward, stop, play, record. Uh, I'm just going to keep those as are because I don't really need to change those. But the other one here is cycle. Now that's the loop function. Don't know why they called it cycle, but that's what it is. And all that button does is enable and disable your loop. So quite frankly, if I could just click there to do that, then I don't feel I need that there. 
So I'll get rid of cycle. And um, and that kind of frees up a little more of the things here. Cause there's click and what's this one? Solo. I don't ever use the solo there. So now I'll get rid of solo. Whenever I want to solo something, I'll click the actual track and solo it. And uh, also there's a shortcut for doing that other solo method, which is S. Um, so, so I don't feel I need that. And I'll just leave everything as it is because now there's room and I have the main things I want. Um, MIDI in and out is useful if you have a MIDI keyboard because it tells you what notes you're pressing, which if you're not um, used to uh, reading music or stuff like that, it makes it easier when you're playing something on the keyboard to transcribe it um, in case you need to like uh, tweak a MIDI region or something like that. So that's one way to optimize your workflow, changing the stuff around here. So uh, obviously there's other things you could do. You could even change settings about what is shown with these. Um, so let's see, here we go, track header components. It's got tons of settings that you could um, show and hide here. You could just go through and work out. And I typically just leave this as is. I think um, if anything, the one thing I have here typically is, um, where was that one? I used to use freeze a lot. And if you have a low power computer, that is going to be essential because when you get to uh, having a lot of tracks, they will slow down your computer like crazy. Um, I don't run into that just because I have an i7 4770K, which is, um, it's the top of the range consumer prosumer. So, um, you know, I could get something that's like uh, server level, but that would just be way too expensive. So anyway, I have that, so I'm not gonna run into that. I don't use freeze, but if you have a computer that is um, not a high-end computer, you're going to want to have freeze because otherwise things will start to freeze and crash. So freeze, what it does is it kind of um, renders down a track to audio and you can't change anything while the track is frozen, but it frees up resources. That's, that's, that's good for that, that's one thing to keep in mind. That will definitely help with your workflow because then you're not running into freezing and saying, oh, I can't play it, there's too many tracks. So, uh, so that's one thing that you really wanna keep, um, keep uh, just keep that in the back of your head so that when, um, when you run into those freezes, you could turn on uh, show freeze and then now I could just freeze these tracks and what it'll do is I'll show you what it does. So we know what this one sounds like. Okay, so that's what that sounds like. Now if I freeze it, See how it doesn't play it at first? It's freezing the track, and uh, one thing to keep in mind is it does freeze it all the way to the end of the project. But now what it does is it still looks the same, but, okay. So now it still sounds the same. What's the difference? There. See, it's, it's got the, uh, the snowflake. I cannot change any of these plugins because it's frozen. So uh, essentially it renders down the audio and, you know, um, reduces the amount of resources that the each track takes. Um, I don't really need that because my computer can handle it. Um, now, other than that, here is not all that much that you need to uh, think about probably. But it, like I said, so there's we had the um, the transport up here with all the buttons and you know working with those. We have these, and um, so that's you know kind of stuff you could change with Logic. Now there's one other thing that makes a big difference, and that is from last uh, the last video. That would be buses and folders. If you set up buses and folders, then it will optimize your workflow considerably. Um, the biggest thing that I do is. Um, for side chaining, I'll send my kick drum to uh, bus 20. That's one thing that I have set in stone. So that means whenever I need to hear the kick drum or I need to use the kick drum for side chaining, I always go to bus 20. It just makes it so much easier because I don't have to figure out, okay, which bus did I put it on? If you, every time, if you just go from one up to the nearest available one, then you will get a mess. If you have numbers that you have set, then um, even though this isn't labeled, I know bus 20 is my side chain for, uh, for the kick drum. I'll talk about side chaining later. I keep on saying that, but yeah, uh, I will cover that, but not in this. Um, long story short, it's something that I use with uh, buses a lot. So anyway, um, so I, I always have my kick on bus 20 
and uh, I always do something similar. I have my reverb on bus 30 or 31, and I have my delay on bus 30 or 31, whichever one is not being used. And um, the reason I do that is that way I have like a master reverb and a master delay. So if I need a little bit of delay or a little bit of reverb on something, I could just put, put send them all to that one and uh, it kind of unifies the song instead of having a different reverb on each one. Also, it frees up resources because if you have a reverb on every single track, what happens is um, the computer has to calculate the reverb uh, for every single track separately, and that takes a lot more than just running all the tracks through one unit and um, and taking care of that one unit. And uh, other things I do is I have, um, if I run an instrument through a bus, it'll be usually bus 1 to 19. And if I run a vocal through a bus, it's usually bus 1 to 10. Um, so unfortunately, Logic creates a lot of reverbs and delays and stuff like that within the first 10 or so, um, thanks to all the new presets that utilize buses. Uh, previously, I don't believe they did. Um, so, so these are kind of getting cluttered up despite the fact that I haven't intentionally created them. Um, so I've actually been starting to use some reverbs here just because that's where logic automatically throws them. And I'm like, what the heck? I'm not going to bother moving them. So that's laziness. And that's, that's the type of optimization too, taking advantage of the stuff that was already put there instead of moving it. Um, granted it's not always the best optimization, but it works to some degree for me. So, uh, that's pretty much, you know, optimizing your workflow. And um, there's there's ways you could do it. You could create a uh, a template to use um, all your uh, to to put all your you know presetting stuff in. So that um, otherwise, every time you create a new project, this transport is going to be different, and you're going to have to reset it every single time. So you want to try try to create a template and just work off of that whenever you uh, create a project, cr uh, open it using that, and then save as a new one, and then just work through. And that way, if you have um, favorite instruments too, you could throw them there, kind of like what's done here for us. Except for um, there's a high chance that uh, I would never use any of these just because I don't like the sound of them. So, uh, but instead I could just put my own favorite uh, synthesizers that I've designed and stuff like that. So that's optimizing your workflow. And um, there, are, there are more ways to do this undoubtedly, but um, for, the, for the most part, you kind of just want to figure out what, what you use the most and how you can make it quickly accessible and how you can make it so you don't have to use it as much if it's something that takes adjusting. Like uh, like I said, for the fact that all the buses are being sent to uh, here for like the, all the, the, this is a reverb, this is a reverb, this is a reverb. Um, I'm not sure if, the, no, this is a uh, track stack. And this is a reverb, this is a reverb, this is a reverb, this is a reverb. So it might be more beneficial for me to start using reverbs from one to 10 and doing vocals uh, from the, from like, let's say 20 to 30. So, uh, so moving my vocals to the place, um, to, to a place that's open and putting my reverbs where the reverbs are naturally occurring. So that's one way I could optimize, although I've been using logic for so long that I've, I'm kind of used to the way I'm doing it and I don't want to change that. Uh, yeah, it's stubborn to me, but it's the way I work. So, um, so yeah, just figure out what works for you and, um, y you won't figure it out right away, but as you're working, you'll, you'll encounter something like for me. Um, with the kick drum for side chaining, I was like, okay, I need a side chain, just create a side chain, and I need a side chain, create a side chain. Which, which one is that? Uh, let me check. Oh, crap. I have a whole bunch of ones that look like this. It says aux 2. Oh, wonderful. So I have no idea what that is. Um, so, so what I ended up doing is I decided, okay, I'm just going to put it on bus 20 from now on. And that way, even though it says aux 2, I know that's my side chain kick. I would never put anything else on bus 20 so um yeah that's uh that's that's you know just think about it keep it in mind when you're working and um and it, it'll change the way you, it'll change the way you uh get stuff done and typically it'll improve the speed at which you get things done and also improve your organization so that's it for this video um 
Now, the next video is going to be part of a uh, of a new uh, sub-series. This series was Introducing Logic Pro. The next sub-series, which starts with the next episode, is going to be Introducing Mixing. That is where things are going to start getting uh, a lot more interesting, and you're going to get into um, all the all the effects here and what everything does. I'm going to talk about how to mix, what's important, what's not important, and um, but I am going to uh, pretty much stick to the essentials. Um, and in later videos, I will get to the more in depth. So when I talk about EQ, um, then I'm going to cover the basics of EQ, and then and not advanced techniques you could do for eq which is uh automating eq is a very advanced technique because it it's kind of hard to do it well um and get it to sound right if you're not using it as an effect and you're using it to mix tracks that's pretty hard um i'm not going to cover that i'm going to cover that later um so yeah it's introducing mixing and the first one is going to actually talk about mixing and uh, the first video is going to be called Mixing an Art or Science. And that was going to be very interesting because is mixing an art or is it a science? It's, it's, it's kind of hard of a question, but um, I'll try to answer as best as I can. If you guys ask questions, I could uh, answer your questions in regards to that also when the, when the video comes out. But uh, for now, uh, just hang tight and I'll get that video as, out as soon as I can. Uh, probably will be posted very short after this video. So um, that's it. Thanks for watching and uh, remember to subscribe and like this video and comment if you have any questions, suggestions or comments. That's it. See ya.